Hey guys, Sarah Prager here with Quist. I'm on my way to the Rainbow History Project's walking tour of DC called Queering Capitol Hill. Really excited, let's go check it out. But in the 1970s, it was called the Life Raft. And the uh, patrons of the Life Raft were colloquially known as the Rubber Duckies. There was uh, inside a plastic fountain that had little yellow rubber ducks floating around, and the patrons came to be known as the Rubber Duckies. Uh, from 1980 to 1987, uh, the bar was called Equus. And then starting in 1987, uh, the name changed to Remington's, and it was Remington's until late last year. Um, interesting spot in the sense of uh, discussing a bit of the history of Marines and the interaction between Marines and the uh, LGBT community on Capitol Hill. We will see and pass by the Marine Barracks and talk about that a little later in the tour. And there have been at least a couple of uh, attacks on the patrons or on the building itself in the course of its being an LGBT site. Uh, in 1982, there were two different attacks on Equus patrons by Marines from the Marine Barracks. Uh, and in 1997, a tear gas bomb was thrown through uh, the windows of Remington's, an event that was covered uh, in the Washington Blade and the other uh, local gay press organs. The Ninth Phase One was founded uh, by Chris Jansen and Alan Carroll in 1970. It is believed to be the oldest continually operating lesbian bar uh, in North America, at least, uh, possibly in the world. Um, and I wanted to mention here uh, something that we haven't talked about much of the other sites, but the, the architecture of Phase One. Uh, from the years of the foundation of Phase, when it could be uh, potentially hazardous to one's career to be seen in a gay or lesbian, uh, an openly gay or lesbian environment. By having uh, the plywood instead of windows, uh, the management was able to sort of keep prying eyes from seeing who was inside uh, the club. And in addition, it was going to you know, decrease the amount of attention that this particular location would draw. Uh, because again, there was concern for the health and safety of the female patrons. Uh, with the combination of the marine barracks down the street uh, and also just the habit that some people had of wanting to kind of go and gawk at the gays and lesbians, kind of that slumming aspect of uh, some people's social lives. Uh, so in an attempt to protect the patrons, again, both from outsiders uh, and from people being able to see in and see who was in the club, uh, we do have this uh, uh, plywood and sort of the, the dark and, and grated door. Uh, FaZe does maintain uh, its policy. Uh, males need to be accompanied uh, by a female friend in order to be allowed into uh, the phase. Again, uh, perhaps another holdover from uh, the days when it was uh, more dangerous than perhaps today. Um, although that's certainly not to minimize uh, the fact that it can still be dangerous for people, uh, even nowadays, uh, to be LGBT. So we're going to head a little bit further up to the next corner. We're going to talk about another one of the uh, the oldest sites uh, on the tour, and also mention uh, the place that was the first to have same-sex dancing uh, in the city. Wayward Books was not specifically a gay and lesbian bookshop, uh, but it was owned by the uh, lesbian um, uh, partnership of Doris Grumbach uh, and her wife Sylvia Pike. Sylvia Pike was a reference librarian at the Library of Congress, 
Doris Grumbach, I saw some nodding when I mentioned her name, uh, extremely well known as a novelist uh, and as a memoirist, uh, and lived for a number of years in Washington, D.C. But she and Pike initially founded Wayward Books uh, in the basement of their shared home in Barnaby Woods in Northwest, 1976. Uh, they wound up moving at first to 1002 Pennsylvania Avenue Southeast, but then from 1985 to 1990, uh, they were here at 325 uh, 7th Street Southeast uh, before moving the business to Sergeant Bill Maine, where they retired after 1990. Um, but from that time, from 1985 to 1990, here on the Hill, uh, they were famous uh, for a quote board that they had outside that was a popular feature in the neighborhood, a daily or weekly quotes. Uh, and Capitol Hill Books around the corner, if anyone's ever been there, that was founded by a former Wayward Books employee. So there is still a little bit of Wayward Books uh, in existence here uh, on Capitol Hill. The other spot is also uh, literary. We're going to talk about 321, uh, which is now Groovy, Cards and Gifts DC. Uh, but that was one of the sites for uh, Lamas, Women's Books and More, here uh, in DC. One of a few. Um, it was uh, on this particular site, or at this location, from, all right. so uh, from 73 to 89, uh, it was in this location on Capitol Hill. It was initially founded as a woman's craft shop and uh, jewelry store uh, by Judy Winsett and Leslie Reeves, but Mary Farmer took it over and ran it from 1976 uh, until 1993 at this and another location in the city, and under Mary Farmer, uh, the emphasis of the store became books. Uh, Susan Sojourner's First Things First mail order shop supplied them with uh, the books that they uh, gave to their customers or, or uh, supplied to their clientele. They're also famous for their readings. A significant number of the most famous lesbian feminist uh, readers of the 1970s and 1980s gave readings uh, at this location of Lamas. That includes uh, Mae Starton, the poet and essayist, Doris Grumbach, who was one of the co-owners of Wayward Books, uh, Cheryl Clark, uh, the African-American lesbian poet, Adrienne Rich, uh, and uh, novelist and essayist Alice Walker all gave readings uh, at uh, Lamas. Thanks for coming with me on the tour. See you next time.